this lecture is all about fertilization, cleavage, and gastrulation. Those are the three major topics, and then we'll move on from there, obviously. These are the initial stages of development. So there are actually four things that a species has to overcome in order for members of the same species to even form a zygote. Four major hurdles that they have to overcome. In some situations, like in the ocean, there are, how do I put this without sounding crass or crude, massive orgies of sperm being released into the environment of, probably didn't do it right, but anyway, there are lots and lots of sperm from a variety of species that's just all over the place, okay? So the question then becomes, how does each species sperm recognize each species egg? Well, that's the first hurdle, species-specific sperm egg recognition. What does that come down to? It comes down to the proteins that are on the sperm and on the protein. If they don't match, then they will not join up with one another. They may touch one another, but they will not go through the next stages of uh, fertilization. So that's one thing that prevents different species sperm fertilizing different species eggs is because of these molecular these proteins that are found on the surface of both the sperm and the egg that are involved in species-specific sperm egg recognition. Once the sperm and the egg have found one another and have the right mojo, um, then, or proteins, then you get regulation of sperm entry into the egg. Now, for humans, we tip, as well as many other species, there typically is an acrosomal cap which has a variety of digestive enzymes that are necessary to, um, to penetrate the uh, zone um, around the egg. Okay? Um, there is a number of things that um, happen, though, to regulate sperm entry. One of the biggest problems that occurs is polyspermy, which is multiple sperm fertilizing one egg. You've got to have just that those two haploid cells fusing to become a diploid cell. Any more chromosomes than that, you have massive problems. Now, in the case of plants, they can tend to, uh, they overcome polyspermy much better than vertebrates and invertebrates. How do you prevent polyspermy then? How, what is the, the, there's actually two major events. There's a, a fast reaction to prevent polyspermy, and then there's a slow reaction to prevent polyspermy. Once the digestive enzymes from the acrosomal cap start breaking through the zona pellucida, which is just a huge barrier outside of the oocyte, um, then once the sperm enters in, once one sperm enters in, the first thing that happens is there's a rapid uh, a repolarization of the membrane. So they typically have a membrane polarity of negative 70 millivolts. As soon as the sperm enters in, then it actually changes the ionic composition around it, and it reverses the polarity of the membrane, so that's about 20 millivolts. This creates a negative, or, or kind of a repulsion of the sperm. Now, this is what's called the fast reaction. But this doesn't really, uh, in fact, you can still get polyspermy. And, and so this is more of one of those, hey, I'm going to hold off all the sperm, until I can get to the slow reaction. And here's the slow reaction, the cortical reaction. The cortical reaction is what seals the deal to prevent polyspermy. What happens is there are these granules with these enzymes that when uh, um, you get this depolarization, initiates these granules to release their enzymes. And what it does is starts chewing away parts of the, uh, the membrane so that the zona pellucida and the membrane of the oocyte just become immensely separated from one another. So basically, there are enzymes that are cutting what's holding the zona pellucida and the, and the oocyte together, and it's then filling with fluid and just massively separating so that all the other sperm are out here, and this just pulls away from that and prevents further sperm from entering in. So that's the cortical reaction. You get these calcium waves that go through and initiate this enzymatic cutting away of the membrane from the uh, zona pellucida. And that's the second thing, is 
once the sperm penetrates that, you, get, you gotta prevent other sperm from entering in and it goes through the, that fast and then slow process of uh, um, prevention of uh, polyspermy. Then, then you've gotta fuse the nuclei. We usually think that that's kind of a simple thing, but it's not quite the easiest thing in the world to get those nuclei, nuclei to fuse together. One of the interesting things about humans is women's oocytes are still undergoing the second stage of meiosis even at the moment of fertilization. And it will not finish meiosis too until fertilization occurs. Then it will get rid of the last pronucleus or the, the last polar body and then you'll get fusion of the two nuclei of the sperm and the egg. So even after a woman has ovulated the oocyte, she actually still has two nuclei, two haploid nuclei in the cell that are finishing up metaphase and they actually kind of stop at metaphase. Sperm fertilizes the egg, it finishes metaphase uh, two and anaphase two and then telophase two, gets rid of one of the uh, uh, polar bodies, one of the nuclei, one of the haploid nuclei, and then you get fusion of the two gametes. And then the last thing, and this is kind of in conjunction with the sperm entry, the cortical reaction doesn't only prevent polyspermy, but it creates these calcium waves that can actually initiate protein synthesis. Remember that the oocyte has these mRNAs that are sequestered to various areas in the cytoplasm, and you need some type of trigger to tell the cell when to turn on translation of these already transcribed mRNAs. Well, that's part of it as well. So the actual fertilization event initiates the translation of these, and sometimes it causes, it binds to proteins that have acted as repressors removing them from that, and then all of a sudden they can be translated into, these uh, mRNAs can be translated into proteins. And then that will then get the ball rolling. It'll start causing gene transcription and translation to occur in the new nucleus and the fused nuclei between the sperm and the egg. And you get the subsequent events that occur from that. Let's look a little bit about the Xenopus. One of the interesting things about frog embryos, and in fact, that's what's illustrated here in this, is the fertilization event isn't just about fusing the nuclei. Because in some cases, it actually matters where the sperm enters and what happens subsequently. For example, in the frog embryo, normally it's like this. The top half of it is actually dark, just like this. It's not pseudocolored. This is what a frog embryo looks like. You have a dark area on the top here, you have a, a, a lighter area down beneath here. Well, the sperm can only enter into this top part. The reason for that is because the, um, you have a, uh, this is what's called the animal pole. It has a lower concentration of yolk. And so the way in which it's configured, sperm can't come in this bottom part at all. It can only come in this top half uh, part right there. Now, as the sperm enters in, that actually predetermines the axes of the Xenopus. In fact, after the sperm enters in, you get what's called a cortical rotation, where this will then move about 30, uh, a 30 degree angle. Now, later on, we'll talk about the relevance of this, but I'll give you a prelude to it. In this top half, initially, there's an even distribution of uh, genes and mRNA, such as uh, disheveled. But when this rotates, it actually rotates the concentration of this, and you start getting disproportion areas, you'll start to see how cleavage will actually generate uh, different amounts of protein in these group of cells and in these group of cells, and that's vital to the overall development of the Xenopus. Like I said, things are not distributed evenly in the initial oocyte. So this leads us to the second concept, which is immediately after fertilization begins, cleavage, which is essentially mitosis and cytokinesis. That's what cleavage is. So. Let's talk about cleavage. In some species, cleavage can occur over and over and over without any growth of the zygote itself. And in fact, that's the case with frog embryos, is that you will go from one large oocyte, or in this case, zygote, once it's fertilized, to hundreds of tiny cells before any of these cells will initiate the growth phases of the cell cycle. So in reality, when you look at certain organisms, they skip <clears throat> G1 and G2 phases of the cell cycle 
and all they do is mitosis and then DNA replication. Mitosis, DNA replication, mitosis, over and over and over again. Now, this only occurs in organisms that have enough nutrients in the organism or in the oocyte or in the environment to do so. In cases like you and I and another species where there is, um, we actually have to get those nutrients from, you know, the mother uh, and whatnot, um, then the, uh, um, we have to go through uh, growth phases where we're taking nutrients and then get bigger and so on and so forth. So it depends upon the species on whether or not they're going to skip those early growth phases of the cell cycle initially, like in the case of the Xenopus, or whether they will take nutrients from the environment to do so. Other strategies might involve a rapid development into a larval stage in which then the larva will then get nutrients and then metamorphosize into the adult phase. So again, there's multiple strategies here. No one size fits all in terms of how cleavage occurs, which is the main point of this part of the lecture. Uh, the way in which this is typically done uh, in the frog is there are proteins that, uh, uh, mRNAs that are in the cytoplasm that get translated. And then when they get translated into this protein, they're kind of on a negative feedback loop where then they initiate something which then turns themselves off and degrades it. And then they get translated again, and then they get degraded, and so on and so forth. And they keep going through this cycle, which is why the frog embryo will go through hundreds of stages of M and S during its cell cycle before it then will, will say, OK, we're done with those 100 cell divisions. Now let's slow it down, go into the growth phase you know, in between each of the cell cycles. So in some cases, there's just rapid uh, division of cells. In fact, it's so rapid that cytokinesis will occur even before the next round of mitosis has even begun. You get these stress folds that start going on. You haven't even fully completed cytokinesis here, and it'll start dividing some more up here. You can also see in this um, embryo that the, the, the oocyte is disproportional in its cleavage. The top part is actually undergoing more cytoplasmic divisions than the bottom part, and that has to do with a number of factors. Here are the factors. Number one, the distribution of yolk. Now, not every organism has yolk. For example, you and I don't have yolk necessarily. In our, uh, but in, when you have birds and, and uh, frogs and whatnot, then again, that yolk, even fish, uh, that distribution of protein, which is the yolk protein, uh, can greatly influence whether or not cytokinesis occurs on the entire oocyte or whether it will occur in just a small portion of the area where the yolk is found. And so we're going to look at various cleavage distribution patterns based upon the yolk distribution. Now, in the case of the Xenopus, it has a very low density of yolk in the animal pole, very high density of yolk in the, in the vegetal pole, which is why you get more cell division in the top part than you do in the bottom part. The other factor that comes into the cleavage pattern of an embryo comes down to the timing and the angle of the mitotic spindle, which in many cases is predetermined by the cytoplasmic components that were put there before fertilization even began. So in some situations, where the mitotic spindle starts forming, which area, for example, where is the nucleus found here? It's not actually found in the vegetal pole. It goes up towards the animal pole. And that influences the first mitotic stages and therefore cleavage stages um, of the xenopus as well as in other organisms. Same thing is true for the, fro uh, for the fish and, and others. So the nucleus, we usually think of it as being right in the middle. It's not always the case. Sometimes the nucleus is right here in the top part where it's got a much thinner yolk. Um, and that influences the angle uh, of the mitotic spindle, where it forms, and, and all of those factors. I've already given you a prelude to it. Animal pole is reference to the low yolk area of an organism, vegetal pole, high yolk. Now, not all organisms have this disproportion of yolk, so to speak. Again, we don't. We don't have yolk concentrations in our cells, so to speak. So these, again, predetermine the cleavage pattern of each of these embryos. Holoblastic cleavage. Holoblastic means the entire zygote, 
So those organisms which undergo holoblastic cleavage, like you and I, the, the whole cell undergoes cleavage. That's not the case for some organisms. Some organisms undergo what's called meroblastic cleavage, where you have the yolk, you get fertilization of the, of the nuclei, but then cleavage will only occur in just the tiniest fraction or portion of, that, uh, of the area around the yolk. That's the case for birds. That's the case for um, fish. So these are just kind of fish, reptiles, and birds. These have this meroblastic uh, cleavage, also for mollusks and cephalopods, but we're not going to get into that, that one. Mainly, we're going to look at discoidal meroblastic cleavage. So for fish and birds and reptiles, they don't encompass and, and uh, undergo cleavage in the entire yolk. In fact, due to the thickness of the yolk, it can't. So all cleavage occurs superficially, just on the surface, and can only disproportion or, or proportion the membrane into cells that it allows. And that's why this is meroblastic. It does not, it only does a part of the yolk rather than the entire oocyte. Now, another version of this is superficial cleavage. And this is what's found in Drosophila. And the reason for that is because the yolk on the peripheral of the oocyte is very thin. So, in fact, this is why when the Drosophila undergo uh, mitosis and make all of these uh, syncytial nuclei and then spread them out around the, the surface, it's because that's really only where cleavage can initially be produced, is on the surface, because the yolk is so thick in the middle that it can't undergo cleavage. So, for Drosophila, theirs is superficial around the periphery of the yolk. It, it looks like it encompasses the entire yolk, but in fact, that middle region doesn't undergo cleavage. So that's how it works in Drosophila. They have superficial meroblastic cleavage. For birds, fish, and mammals, they have what's called discoidal meroblastic cleavage, which is, just means it's on the surface. It's just on a tiny portion of the surface. For us, we're looking more at rotational cleavage right here, where, in fact, what's interesting is it'll undergo cleavage, and then perpendicular to that, the next cell will undergo cleavage. It actually goes perpendicular, and it keeps doing that. And uh, it's not just like cut in half, cut in half, cut in half. It's not like that. It is like that for sea urchins, um, where you typically have what's called radial cleavage. Radial cleavage means Cuts it in half, cuts it in half, cuts it in half. Everything's, all the, the, the cells are kind of perfectly undergoing mitosis and splitting the cells up evenly, at least in the initial stages. Even though for amphibians, it is holoblastic because it does do the entire oocyte, it's what's called displaced holoblastic cleavage because it's not exactly proportional. Why not? Because of the yolk much thicker here in the vegetal pole than it is in the animal pole, which is a, has a much thinner yolk area. So even though it encompasses the entire oocyte, due to the yolk distribution, xenopus, or amphibians, tend to have these smaller blastomeres on the top and much bigger blastomeres on the bottom as the cells undergo cleavage. Sea urchins. Here are the three model invertebrate organisms that are used for development. Now, over the next few weeks, we're going to uh, go in depth into what are the advantages and disadvantages of using these models. What can we learn from each of these model organisms about ourselves? Because honestly, yeah, it's important that we learn about other organisms, but I'd rather learn about us. And most of the medical discoveries that we have, a lot of them come from learning about these invertebrate model organisms. We learn quite a bit. In fact, C. elegans was one of the first organisms that we uh, sequenced its entire genome before almost any other. And we learned quite a bit from that sequencing of its genome. Um, so sea urchins, sea elegans, these are a worm, and Drosophila, the fruit fly. These are three invertebrate models that are used quite substantially. Now again, sea urchins, these have radial holoblastic cleavage. In the initial stages, they pretty much have the same divisions. It's, a, it's along the same axis, and it keeps dividing them. Now, over time, eventually you start having 
these macromeres, these are much larger cells, and you have these micromeres up here, or actually mesomeres, and then the small under here, micromeres. You can see how it's not like clear cut and dry, even in this situation. Initially, all the cells are about the same size. And then you start getting into some subdivisions where these will undergo more rapid mitotic phases, and these uh, not so much, and then you'll end up developing these even smaller cells. Notice the fate mapping here. What do you notice different about the fate mapping here than you do in others? They're not in order. Typically, in other organisms, you have ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. The reason for that is in the gastrulation events or the movement of the cells, these cells will invaginate and move inward and eventually form the second layer. So even though they are found here, you know, you'd be like, well, why aren't they in the three layers as they should be? It's because these will actually move inward and become that middle layer that becomes the muscle and things of that sort. So this one's fairly unique. C. elegans. What's fascinating about C. elegans, they have an exact number of cells. I mean, every time it's like 1,000, I'm trying to remember what the exact number is, but it's like 1,079. They count it every time, and there is the exact same number of cells every time that this organism develops. It's just fascinating. This one has, similar to you and I, rotational holoblastic cleavage. One of the things I want to point out here, after the very first cell division, these cells are already pre-established autonomously to become the germline cells. And it's just fascinating that they've already had the maternal components to develop autonomously into the germline cells. So this will split, and then the cells, the, the, the mitotic spindle, here's an example of the, where the position of the mitotic spindle matters. The mitotic spindle will shift, and then the cells will split, and then it'll shift, and they'll split. That's why it's called rotational holoblastic cleavage, is the entire oocyte will undergo cytokinesis, but every time it does, the mitotic spindle formation will shift and then split, and then it'll shift in each one of those cells. Drosophila is, remember, syncytial meroblastic. Meroblastic because it doesn't uh, uh, split all of the cytoplasm or the yolk. It only undergoes cleavage in the peripheral. So this is a superficial cleavage. All this middle area right here, this is the yolk. This is the nutrients that the Drosophila needs in order for the cells to undergo their growth phases. And as they're moving around, they take the nutrients as they need it. But it is meroblastic and superficial because the periphery of the yolk is where it has the lowest density of that, which is why that's where mitosis and cleavage will essentially undergo is in that outer region. Vertebrates, these are all pretty much holoblastic, except for the zebrafish, which is meroblastic. Um, oh no, and chick, sorry. Zebrafish and gallus, these are uh, meroblastic. Frog is holoblastic. Mice, humans, mammals, we're all holoblastic. Now, uh, today, we're also gonna start talking about gastrulation. One of the important things in many of the formation of the embryos is once the cells start undergoing cleavage, um, there is typically the formation of what's called a blastocele, a blastocele, which is the cells will pull fluid from the outside environment and push it in to create this, um, pretty much this uh, um, vacancy where there are no cells, a large gap of fluid-filled area, which we call the blastocele. This is essential for the uh, um, patterning of the three germ layers because scientists have shown that if you remove the blastocele and the ectoderm comes in contact with these vegetal pole cells, these will not become ectoderm anymore. There has to be a separation. Why do you think that is? What might be something that, why there needs to be this huge gap or separation? Paracrine signaling, there you go. So paracrine signaling, remember, is indiscriminate in where it spreads it out. So there needs to be this gap so that these tissues up here are not uh, induced by the paracrine signaling of these cells down here. And you'll find this to be the case in uh, a lot of embryos. There's always there's this blastocele that is necessary for not only the separation so that paracrine signaling can't affect certain cells, but also in the gastrulation or the movement of the cells, it provides mobility for the cells to be able to move around. It gives them some space and some flexibility 
and being able to move in that environment. So that happens fairly early on in the cleavage process as well of the xenopus is that they will start filling this area full of fluid, which forms the blastocele. In fact, this happens too. We look at the sea urchins. After several stages of cleavage in the sea urchins, it also will form a blastocele. So here, after the first few stages, you can see the blastocele forming right here, right in the middle of that. In fact, it forms so that the cells are on the periphery, and then you have this huge blastocele in the middle during sea urchin gastrulation. Okay? So even sea urchins, as we'll see, as in chickens and whatnot, you, you get blastoceles all over the place. The entire embryo we call a blastula. Okay? So this is just some terminology you should be familiar with. Blastomeres are the cells. Blastocele is this fluid-filled area. And the entire thing is the blastula. So zebrafish. One of the events after fertilization in the zebrafish is you have these actin filaments, which are part of the cytoskeleton, that will actually squeeze a portion of the uh, oocyte, and it forms this non yolky area in the animal pole. And that is where the embryo or where cleavage is going to occur. So it's meroblastic because, again, it's only going to form in a small area. It's not going to encompass the entire yolk. Uh, in fact, it'll squeeze it so that you get this little bubble forming on top, just like that right there. This is discoidal meroblastic cleavage. So meroblastic because it does not include the entire embryo. You can see here, it almost looks like bread. <laughs> Down here beneath this area right there, this does not undergo cleavage at all. All the cleavage is going to occur right on top of this yolk area. So none of the this yolk area is going to undergo cleavage. Now, doesn't mean that there's not any nuclei in here. In fact, that's a critical part in the gastrulation is you have some syncytial nuclei that do not get sequestered initially into the cells. Okay? So there, there are nuclei that are going to be within the yolky area that don't actually have uh, uh, form into various blastomeres. Okay? So that's one of the activation events of the zebrafish uh, is once fertilization occurs, then it just the, the cytoskeleton squeezes it, creates this little bubble on top, and that's where uh, um, cleavage can occur uh, in that area. Between the top area and the bottom area, we have what's called the yolk syncytial layer, okay, where you're going to have a lot of these nuclei sitting just beneath. And these do play a role in the patterning of the overall embryo. Eventually, what will happen is the cells will envelop the entire yolk, will actually surround the yolk, and then start drawing nutrients from the yolk. So the cells will develop early on on top and then they'll eventually form this shield that will surround the yolk and start pulling nutrients uh, uh, from the yolk itself. Now, chick development. Chick development is the closest in terms of patterning to human development. Yeah, even though chicks are not mammals, you know, um, if you look at a mouse and how it develops, it's pretty weird by comparison in terms of how the germ layers get set up. So just keep that in mind. One of the things that's, that is really important about chick early development is the stages, the, at least the initial stages of chick development pattern almost identically to human development um, in terms of how cleavage occurs and how you form the epiblast and the hypoblast and things of that sort. All right, now here's one of the things. Fertilization occurs before before the egg is laid, okay? So the hen and the rooster got to do their thing before the hit, uh, lays its egg. Because what happens is, as soon as the hen creates the calcium shell around the egg, you can't fertilize it anymore. So in fact, fertilization has to occur, and then, and then the actual egg starts forming around the albumin, the shell, the calcium. Um, is going to form around that. So fertilization becomes internally. In fact, by the time that the chicken lays the egg, it's already undergone several stages of cleavage um, in the early development. So even if you pull a freshly hatched egg, it's already very much progressed down the developmental process. 
and then we can incubate it further and look at certain stages beyond that point. Again, this is meroblastic. It sits just on top of the yolk. It's not, it's not identical to zebrafish in that you don't get this bubbling up of an area. It just kind of starts dividing right on top of the top layer of the yolk. There's no kind of pushing of a membrane up. It just takes place right on top of it. So it's similar to zebrafish in that it's meroblastic, but it's not similar in that you don't form this bubble on top of it like you do with the zebrafish. Um, so if you look at it, you have two main areas. And the two main areas are what we call the area pellucida, which is the lighter area, and the area opaca, which is the more opaque or kind of like looking through a foggy mirror type of thing. Uh, area. Now, the biggest difference here is this right here, this area, the area opaca, this is where the cell undergoes cleavage and actually starts forming all of the, uh, uh, you know, blastomeres uh, around the nuclei. And it just keeps sequestering and making more and making more and using up the nutrients and just starts building up on in that area. Now, the reason why this area is called the area pellucida is because early on, these cells will then start pulling fluid in and guess what they form just beneath it? The blastocele. So we sometimes call it the subgerminal cavity or subgerminal space, but that's really the blastocele. That's that area that's going to form kind of that separate barrier. barrier okay? So it'll actually, that's why this area is much clearer. When you look under a microscope, you can actually inject some ink down here, and that helps you see the uh, white cells or the embryo itself. So the area opaca is the, are the cells that are touching the yolk, and the area pellucida is the area that has this blastocele just beneath it. Okay? Now, these cells right here are going to entirely form all three germ layers. This is what we call the epiblast. Okay? So the epiblast will become the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. That's the fate of these cells. The reason why I emphasize that is because during the cleavage process and then subsequent gastrulation, there's a second layer of cells that forms just beneath it called the hypoblast. But the hypoblast does not become part of the embryo. In fact, the main role of the hypoblast is for secreting paracrine factors for the patterning of the three germ layers from the epiblast. That's its role. The hypoblast essentially is this sheet of cells just beneath the epiblast and they secrete various paracrine factors at various times, and that's going to pattern or start influencing the formation of the three germ layers from the epiblast. So the hypoblast does secrete the paracrine factors that will induce this epiblast to start becoming tissues. In fact, when we look at fate maps, we can actually say, hey, the cells from this region are going to contribute to the heart, the ones from this region are going to contribute to the uh, endothelial lining, and so on and so forth. We know where the cells will eventually end up due to fate mapping. So we know that these early stages of uh, cleavage even have inductive signaling by the hypoblasts. We form a two-layer blastoderm as well for human development. Okay, so here's the blastocele. In that, the, that space in between the epiblast and the hypoblast is what we technically call the blastocele. That's that fluid-filled area that allows for uh, the movement of cells as well as these inductive events. In the initial stages, too, there are various regions of the embryo on what we call an organizer. And the reason why they're called the organizer is because they're a group of cells that will condition other cells on what fate they're supposed to take on. They release paracrine factors uh, as they move around, and as cells come in contact with them, it causes these inductive events that are necessary for the patterning. So each of these organisms that we're going to talk about will show you where the organizer starts forming and its role in gastrulation. Let's talk about mice. Now, the initial stages of mice actually are more akin to you and I in terms of the initial stages of cleavage. Obviously, humans don't start out uh, with, with the yolk and the cells undergoing cleavage. So when I say that this, uh, uh, the cleavage of um, and gastrulation of chickens is more similar to humans, I'm talking more about this stage right here with the epiblast and the hypoblast. However, in terms of the initial stages of cleavage from the uh, single-celled uh, zygote, 
mice, again, are more similar to humans in that it's holoblastic, not meroblastic, so it encompasses the entire, uh, entire zygote. And it undergoes, you know, basically multiple cleavage events and, and uh, uh, rotate, or in this case, this is isolithal, which means that all of the uh, cells are going to be um, uh, the exact same size. And the same thing is true for, for humans. The cells are all the same size when they undergo cleavage. Okay? So you don't get different size uh, uh, blastomeres like you do with xenopus or sea urchins and things like that. Again, you can see right here, this area, there's the blastocele. So this forms early on in mice. This also forms early on in humans, where we have a blastocele forming. So you get kind of this layer on the outside that will form the extra embryonic tissue where you get implantation into the uterus. And then you get these cells in the middle called the inner cell mass. That's what becomes you and I. That's what becomes the embryo proper, as we call it. So that inner cell mass group of cells, even after three or four days, are still undifferentiated. These cells can split, and that's where you get identical twins coming from. And each one of those split masses can become their own embryo. And due to the fact that they've been undergoing mitosis this whole time, they are genetically identical to one another, which is why you get identical twins. All right, so um, again, in mammals, what's interesting, and this is different between amphibians versus mammals. Amphibians, it, you get them on the same plane initially. But for mammals, you get it cut once, and then one of them's going to go this way, and the other one's going to go perpendicular to it. So that's just how the cleavage pattern works. Eventually, after about eight cells form, they start increasing the cell adhesion molecules, and they come super compacted together, in fact, to the point where you can hardly tell one cell from another. Once the cells compact together and you start forming more of them, these cells are going to pull in water through osmosis and form the blastocele. Okay, so that fluid fills space that's necessary. The cells on the perimeter of this, uh, what we call the trophoblast, these will become the extra embryonic tissue, the placenta, the umbilical cord, whereas the cells in the middle, the inner cell mass, that becomes the actual embryo itself. Okay, so gastrulation. Again, these are movements that are induced by the cell-cell interaction. Again, we've got cadherins that are causing cells to either attract to one another, to repel to one another, causes uh, changes in, in uh, their adhesion as well as their affinity. We talked about you know, the different types of cadherins. So that plays a major role in gastrulation as well, is why do cells pull away from one another? Because when they start becoming specified to become mesoderm, they're going to express different cadherins. They're not going to adhere to the ectoderm anymore, and they're going to move away from them. And that will then, therefore, influence what type of further interactions they're going to have with other types of cells. This is really just the rearrangement of the cells to form the three germ layers. Okay? So we talked about last time on how the sea urchins, if you look at the fate map of sea urchins, what did we say was odd about that? The order in the fate map. Usually it's supposed to go blue, red, yellow, where the mesoderm comes right next to the uh, um, ectoderm and the endoderm is beneath that. Well, again, the reason why the mesoderm is down here is because this is the first mode of gastrulation you're going to uh, understand, these cells invaginate, which means that they will literally move into the cell, upwards and into the cell, being enveloped by the ectoderm. Okay? So invagination is the process where the cells will actually move inward into the cell, kind of creating a pit. You can see that in this picture right here, an enfolding of a sheet of cells into the embryo. And this is kind of a cross-section of it. Looking at that, you can see this infolding of these cells in the sea urchin. Again, this is one of the reasons why you need a blastocele in the middle of it, so that these cells can invaginate inwards. Now, involution. The uh, prime example of involution is, um, uh, there's two examples. One is in the frog or the xenopus. So over here, right between 
the, these two layers where the ectoderm, and you actually get mesoderm here as well as the endoderm, meet. This is what we call the organizing center. Again, I'll talk more about the organizer, but this in frogs is where the organizer begins. And at this area, these cells will start turning inward underneath an outer layer, and we call that involution. So it's not an invagination, because you're not getting an entire sheet folding inwards and kind of creating this pit. So we call it involution, because one sheet is basically turning up underneath another sheet. Okay, so that's involution. The same thing happens with zebrafish. When the embryonic shield starts moving around, cells turn inwards and move up underneath the outer layer of these cells. So involution occurs as the embryonic shield of, uh, here we go. So here in the zebrafish, this yellow area is the yolk. As the embryonic shield starts moving down, the cells will undergo involution and actually start moving up underneath and then back under this top layer. So in zebrafish gastrulation, involution occurs in the formation of the embryonic shield. In xenopus gastrulation, involution occurs uh, uh, at basically the junction between the ectoderm and the endoderm. Ingression. Ingression is when you get what we call an epithelial to mesenchyme transition. So here, what you get in the initial stages of the sea urchins is these cells will pull away from this layer of cells and migrate inwards. That's ingression. So you get migration of individual cells that have broken free from the epithelial cells in that area, and they migrate you know, to some particular area. So that's ingression. Let's talk about delamination. The reason why we don't typically call this ingression is because delamination is when one sheet of epithelial cells typically splits and becomes a second sheet of epithelial cells. So in this one, this one's kind of an odd duck in terms of chicken because technically these cells are ingressing, but then they form another sheet of epithelial tissue, which is what delamination is. So delamination, kind of think of laminate paper, you have two sheets, essentially. So delamination is where one sheet of cells splits and essentially becomes two sheets. The cells can either migrate or they can just kind of split this way and become two entirely, uh, uh, two sheets of cells. So that's what we call delamination. So epiboly is when the cells actually expand and essentially cover other cells or the yolk itself. When those cells underwent that initial stages of cleavage, then they underwent what we call epiboly, where they'll actually expand and then completely surround and envelop another group of cells. Now, another example of this is in Xenopus. Xenopus has the same things. Not only do cells ingre or involute and come underneath, but then you have the outer layer of cells coating and completely surrounding and moving till it completely seals off this what we call yolk plug. Uh, which is just a tiny area that eventually becomes close up.